Yeah. So where did the, the genesis for this book come from? It came from, it's so funny because we've almost exclusively talk, uh, spoken here about gay rights issues yeah. and it's only one chapter in the book. Well, that, However, I want, it's funny because I wanted to get it out of the way and yet it, well, it except, then bleeds into everything. Yeah. Except you've now asked a question. The answer is uh, the Brendan Eich Mozilla episode of 2014. Yeah, can that, you refresh people on that? Yeah, so this was the, uh, a gentleman out here in California who helped co-found Mozilla, the internet company, and he was elevated in 2014 to CEO of that company, and then it was revealed that he had donated like $1,000 yeah. of yeah. his private money to Proposition 8, which here in this state was the one man, one woman amendment, 2008, passed by the way, uh, in this you know backwoods, right wing place, California, um, and this was, this was a thought crime that could not be tolerated. And eventually, to make the long story short, he was hounded out of the company that he founded for holding a mainstream political position mm -hmm. that Mary Catherine and I happened to disagree with him on. But we were very troubled by how that all went down. And that was actually the catalyst to get off of our asses and write this thing because we're like, can you, like, this is, this is scary. We disagree with him, but what happened to him doesn't really feel like America to us. And they were like, you know, someone really ought to write a book about this. We're like, oh crap, it's us. <laughs> That's a lot of work, as you know. Yeah. Um, but it was worth it. And now the book just came out in paperback uh, this month. And the reason that we finally decided, all right, we need to update this thing. So end of discussion came out in June of 2015, mm -hmm. one week before Donald Trump announced that he was running for president. So his name did not appear in the book once. And so the new chapter that we've added to the paperback edition begins with the line, Donald Trump is president and Berkeley is burning. Perhaps we should revisit our subject. <laughs> and what finally put us over the top was Mary Catherine got an email from the LA Times actually, uh, weeks and weeks ago at this point saying, you know, with everything happening in Berkeley and Middlebury, we'd love for you to write an op-ed about your new book. And then 10 minutes later, she got a response email again saying, it has come to our attention, this is not a new <laughs> book, but it, it was yeah. as red hot, unfortunately, hotter than ever in terms of the topic, which might be good for book sales, but it's bad, bad news for the country. Do you see any hope for the counter movement? to the end of discussion that's happening in America yes. right now. Yes, yeah, um, for a number of reasons. You know, the, we anticipated in the book a backlash. We had no idea that it would come so quickly in the form of really Donald Trump, who's just this giant middle finger to this entire culture. And some people are like, oh, is that really what happened? It's not by any stretch the entirety of it, but if you don't believe that political correctness and the backlash against that was not a huge part of the appeal of Donald Trump, I think you're asleep. I think it's indisputable in my view. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the, when it comes to this backlash and some of the hopeful signs, one is there have been increasing efforts at pushback from the academy, from within. A, a dozens of professors at Middlebury wrote and signed this amazing letter about free expression after that whole incident went down. Jonathan Haidt from NYU has yep. started this heterodox, heterodox university or academy, or academy yeah. which I think is terrific and, and people are signing up because I think there are people on the left looking over their shoulders saying, I thought I was a liberal in good standing, but the, you know who knows who the jackals are gonna come after next. This is getting out of hand. Um, so that's, that's where we really derive some hope where we're telling folks, and we, we speak on campuses, and we really wrote the book not to be a right-wing, pound-the-table book. We're trying to persuade people not to necessarily agree with us on every issue, but to join us on this, this fundamental question of, are we gonna be a, a society that can actually talk about things or not? And if yeah. we can't talk about things anymore, we're not gonna solve any of our problems. So in a sort of selfish way, but I guess also in a societal way, every time this eats another liberal or lefty or progressive, you must love it, right? I mean, like, <laughs> like the Evergreen State thing with Brett Weinstein. Oh my gosh. You, you must have loved it, because here's the, this guy is at the furthest left college. I know. He's the furthest left professor, yeah. deeply progressive, as he said to Tucker Carlson, and they ate him, yeah. so you must be going. Yeah, so you guys, this is like, a good sign. Like we, uh, we told you. Like, <laughs> You should buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, the the one that I get a kick out of still because it's a few old, a few years old now. This example, but 
one of the things that we argue in end of discussion is that like the left is forgetting how to argue even amongst themselves, right? It's not just all this demagogic fire at the right. That's been true for a while, though it's getting worse. This is their form of argument now. This is their, you know, identity politics and the impugning of motives and outrage has supplanted rational argument. And so uh, there was this episode towards the end of the Obama presidency where there was a dust up on the left over T TPP. So we mm -hmm. are talking about trade policy, yeah. okay? We're not talking about trans bans mm -hmm. or anything. Trade policy. And uh, Elizabeth Warren. The word trans was in it though. That is that is true. Trans Pacific. That is, right. that is So it may have yeah. confused a couple people. Good, but good point. That being said. Point taken. Um, <laughs> The President Obama was on the other side of this issue from Elizabeth Warren, the mm -hmm. senator, uh, who we also really go after in the book in a sort of delicious way. But I digress. Uh, at one point, Obama was asked about Warren's criticism of TPP, and he responded by saying, well, Liz, blah, blah, blah. And a bunch of people on the left were like, whoa, did you just refer to a sitting senator by her <laughs> first name? That is really mansplaining and patriarchal and really problematic and including some members of the Senate were attacking Obama mm -hmm. for using her first name. And so we're like sitting back with a giant thing of popcorn and we're like, oh, um, excuse me, but are you criticizing our first black president? Because that seems kind of racist based on your whole thing. And it got into this sexist versus racist thing. I'm like, you guys, this is it. This is getting bananas. Yeah. And so, I don't know, sometimes we, we try to give those types of examples to say to liberals like it's not we're not the only victims of this and i also want to make one other point the left isn't the only perpetrators of this so, either. and that's exactly where i want oh to there go. you go segue ask yeah. the question great yeah. well no i'll let you do it but what i wanted to know is because that's what people say to me all the time that i'm now because i've so exposed this thing and i've so focused on this intersectional monster that will eat everyone mm -hmm. and it will pit actually black people against gay people and at the oppression olympics and we've all you know victimhood is virtue and this whole thing that, that somehow i've let the right off the hook here so hook that right for me can, we do. Me, yeah, so we, tell we, me. We do, um, and one of our goals was to be intellectually honest. Um, and in fact, in the process of writing the book before, this was initially, 2015, before we submitted our final manuscript, uh, a very good buddy of mine, actually my ex's brother, uh, he is one of the most well-read, sharpest guys I know. And he's, a, he's an attorney, he's done very well, his credentials are impeccable academically. And I asked him, I said, look, we're gonna be submitting this manuscript. We wanna be intellectually honest. I know you're not gonna agree with me on policy issues, A, B, or C. Would you do us the favor and the honor of reading the manuscript and giving us feedback, not about where we're wrong, but where we are not fair to people on your side, hmm. where we have intellectual blind spots that would potentially turn someone off from being persuaded by us. So he read the whole thing and he came back and he said, this is, actually quite well written. I was like, thanks. Um, he said, and it's funny and it, I, I'm, I'm persuaded, but here are six examples of things where I think that you would lose some credibility. Uh, and we went through all of them and said, yeah, this is legit. And we, and we changed the manuscript beforehand because we really wanted to be fair and honest. And that includes being critical of our side and even ourselves. We give an example in here where we have contributed personally to this problem as well. Yeah, so, so where, where have you contributed to it? So I, I remember, and part of this is just sort of the impugning of motives and just the uh, over-the-top outrage. I was on the air in Chicago. I had a radio show, my first sort of gig out of college. I had a weekend show in Chicago. And I was on the air on a Sunday night in March of 2010 when Obamacare finally passed into law. And I had spent month after month fighting this thing, and for good reason. I was worried we would never be able to uproot it, and it seems that that was a well-founded fear. Yeah. Um, and I had really poured my heart and soul and intellectual all into this fight, and then I was watching it go down live on the screen while I'm live on the air, and I remember the phone lines on my radio show were absolutely jam-packed, 10 lines from 15 minutes before the show started until well after the show ended. Mm -hmm. People were so emotional and so was I. And I went on a rant during the show about 
and I called out every single Democratic congressperson from Illinois and the surrounding states who had voted for it and was doing a roll call of who they had, who we had to beat mm -hmm. in the next election. By the way, we beat almost all of them. But I took it a step further and I was talking about punishing their families and not giving their kids jobs and not writing letters of recommendation for their children. And it was, it was too much. And it was, it was unhinged outrage. And that was you know, part of this outrage environment that gets the, better, that gets the best of our rational discourse uh, discussion sometimes. So that was sort of an example that I gave uh, about myself. And then we also do this like um, during the Iraq war, there was this unfair conflation of being against the war and being against the troops. Mm -hmm. That's a, a dishonest way of arguing. Um, criticizing Israeli policy is sometimes immediately called anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. There is crossover, believe me, but I think making that argument right out of the gate is um, unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there is this impulse, I think, on the right also to say, Black Lives Matter is an anti-police or pro-cop death organization. There's a lot of demagoguery about that, which I think is uh, grossly uh, mischaracterizing how many people who are associated with that movement feel and what they believe and what their genuine grievances might be and why. And so both sides argue this way. The reason that we go harder after the left is because they control the taste-making institutions in this country. They control academia, they control most of the media, and they control Hollywood and entertainment. And when you have that heft on your side and you can sort of impose the culture much more easily, they, they are the bigger part of the problem. I have no doubt, though, if the roles were reversed, yeah. human nature and bad authoritarian impulses are not relegated to one side. We would be doing the same thing, I think. I, I completely agree, and it's why you know people will, every now and again, I'll say something on Twitter and someone will find something that I said five years ago that was I said the other way, and, it's, and they'll be like, gotcha. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, no. Actually, circumstances changed, the power changed, I evolved, which I think is a little something of, of how humans are supposed to operate. Yes. And that power corrupts and that suddenly you, you lose your, your moral compass when you're suddenly <laughs> magically in power. I got it, I was tweeting about, because during the healthcare debate, this most recent healthcare debate, just the rhetoric on the left was unreal. It's like the Republicans are going to kill thousands of people. 20 million people, and I heard. And strip 22 million people from their healthcare. And it was just like detached from any fair reading of reality, but it was, you know, we have to beat this no matter what, we'll say anything. So I was objecting to this, you know, they, they blame our rhetoric for stuff that has nothing to do with our rhetoric. And then a week after uh, Steve Scalise gets shot by a Bernie Sanders supporter, Sanders is out there saying the Republican health care bill would be like nine 9-11s every year. And I'm like, wh like what, are the, what are the standards here? Mm -hmm. So I was objecting to something that Hillary Clinton had said saying that the Republicans would be, you might as well rename them the death party or something like that. And I was like, wow. And uh, some lefty blogger found a piece, a short blog post that I wrote in college, like 11 years ago, mm -hmm. praising a book by Ramesh Panuru, which was called The Party of Death, and it was about abortion. And he was just like, bang, <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. And I'm like, it's, it's sort of tough to make a life comes at you fast meme when it's like 11 years apart. Yeah. Uh, and I remember even at the time asking Ramesh, like, do you think this title might turn some people off? Anyway, I get it. I mean, that's, that's Twitter, Twitter culture. And we're not going to be perfect. Like, that's why we say in a discussion, we are not the exemplars of per like, <laughs> like pristine public discourse at yeah. every turn. We're just trying to be better about it. And we're hoping to encourage others uh, to join us. Well, it's funny because I always find that I'm, I'm basically within these four walls in this room, I'm pretty much at my best in terms of my intellect, how I treat people, all those things. <laughs> it's all Twitter, downhill. Twitter, you know, I'm pretty good in my private life too, but Twitter often brings out the worst in me. Yeah. Suddenly I'm fighting with someone that I don't really care about. You know, you see these outrages all day long. I try, I've been doing it less and less. But just the other day I saw somebody had tweeted something about basically all the white interns now at the White House, and you retweeted it, and yeah. you, you grabbed, I guess, from their own company's website, how many uh, yeah. white people, they were basically 0% black interns, was it black interns? It was or? his leadership team. So he had, yeah. he had said, look at all these white male interns that Trump has, 
and I just went to his bio, <laughs> clicked on his own website of the company <laughs> that he founded, and it's like, meet the team. Yeah. And the team was mostly white dudes. Um, and no black people, so I just mirrored his tweet, but with his company, yeah. and that that kind of went a little bit viral. Which I don't think that that's um, over the top, or no. I, like sometimes you've got to fight back on some of this stuff because they're fake moralizing. And that, then no, if, that's yeah. the point. Like yeah. I don't. That's and that's the thing. I didn't think that this guy's company is morally <laughs> worse or bad at their work because it's disproportionately fill in the blank identity politics. I just think for. I think there's something really weird in someone's head. Mm -hmm. He was a former Obama official, by the way. Yeah. There's something weird in someone's head when they see a photograph of 120 college kids, and the first thing they do is like slot these people into like gender and race immediately to make some political point. Like if that's the the game you're going to play, here's how that might apply to you. And so I was by no means embracing identity politics. I was ridiculing it, and I think. Ridicule is sometimes uh, one of the better tactics we have. Does that show you, though, how well their tactics have worked for so long because now the thinking has gotten so sloppy? So, for example, I saw a recent tweet by Chris Hayes from MSNBC talking about all this Scaramucci stuff, which, again, was it's happening right now as we tape this, but it'll be a couple weeks ago by the time we air this. Uh, but saying something about Scaramucci how Scaramucci might be president by he the could time be pre this airs. He could be president, he could be put to Siberia, like we have no freaking clue what's gonna happen. But, I but, hear he might have connections in Russia. He might have connections in Italy. You never know. Ah, uh, we'll see. I think that's but the, problematic. The, but the point is, uh, I saw Chris Hayes tweeted something to the effect of, if these guys, were, if if these were black people doing this in the White House, everybody would be up in arms. So I'm loosely quoting him. But I thought, the idea that you took something Wait, there, there's no are racial. Are people not up in arms about it? I mean, how much right. more up in arms can people be? For, about so the I, so I may be. I'm not. I may not have been up in arms as the phrase. Fair but enough. point. But point being that. You took something that there's no racial connotation to this discussion. You know what I mean? No one's claiming yes. Scarmucci's a racist, or there's just nothing racial about this. And now you're giving it the racial lens just to give the meat to the people that you're talking about yep. right here. And, and I that's know, dangerous. I know Chris, and I like Chris, and sometimes we come at each other with some brushback pitches on, on Twitter, and that's fine, because I just the gratuitous, endless parade of identity politics is just completely exhausting um, and again it's it's a substitute it's a shortcut to sort of bypass any real debate and that's actually the way that we describe end of discussion it's how primarily the left is trying to win cultural debates and political debates by preventing the debates from happening they want to win by default just because mm -hmm. we're bad we're blankist and therefore our ideas don't need a fair hearing because obviously, right? It's sort of like this self-fulfilling tautology. They're bad because they're bad because they're mm -hmm. bad, and end of discussion. And we're like, no, that's that's not how this should go. Who's your kind of Republican? If you were looking at all of them. Oh boy. Sell me on a Republican. I, I am open-minded, truly. I, on any I, of them? Give me give me somebody that you think is doing this thing right from, from the Republican perspective. Really, Again, you said you're more of a conservative than yeah. a Republican. All right, so just from a conservative perspective, who, who do you think is basically doing it right? I really like Ben Sass, mm -hmm. uh, the Nebraska senator. Yeah. I think he's principled, I think he's really smart, I think he's got a great sense of what civic duty means and shouldn't mean. He has I a sense of humor, He's too. funny, yeah. he does, he does this stuff where he goes to his home state and he works a full day on a variety of jobs randomly. No press, no cameras. He'll go and work at a mechanics shop for a nine hour day and just like show me what you do, talk to me about your life. He drives Uber, <laughs> uh, which is-, is that right? He drives Uber, it's incredible. Uh, I just, I think he's really good. And I'm sure you can find something where I disagree with him or where I think he's done something wrong, but. I think he's great, and I, I really get the sense in meeting with him and talking with him that he means it when he says, the, the goal of my life is not to be a U.S. senator, right? That this is not the end-all, be-all of life. Um, and he's got a really interesting book out, as long as we're plugging books. Uh, I like, in terms of the Trump administration, I really like Nikki Haley mm -hmm. at the U.N. I think she did a really nice job in South Carolina as governor. She navigated some difficult things quite well. She's been willing to step out and uh, say things that are not necessarily the exact party line all of the time, mm -hmm. um, with some moral clarity about some important things. And certainly not the UN party line. Yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. not. I mean, but not even the Trump party line yeah. is what I'm saying. Um, 
So those are two. I don't want to exclude anyone. There's plenty of people in the party that I really respect and like. Yeah. Um, even if they have their quirks, and there, there's no such thing as a perfect political figure. And when you start to think that there is, yeah. you're going to get super disappointed. Yeah, well, that's also why I, I focus on the left because I came from the left, but also that they seem to have this concept that if they could only get their people in, everything would be perfect. So it's never about the principles. It's only if Bernie would get in or, or Elizabeth Warren would get in, everything will become perfect. And that's such a, that, that hero worship, and again, there's plenty of people that worship Trump, so I'm not saying that doesn't exist. Yes. But that sort of hero worship, I think, is the most dangerous thing. I would rather take the power away from all of these people. And yes. I think we'd be in better shape. No, personality cults are weird and creepy, especially in politics, and I think it, it sort of robs people of reason. Where, and just like the double standards, it drives me, it drives me crazy, where you have people, and this is tribalism, right? People willing to defend ap almost anything if it's their guy, when they would be going apoplectic if it was the other side doing it. And there's no real argument for it other than, well, that's them and they're bad. And we're us and we're not. Yeah. We're good. We're, we're for America, okay? <laughs> and it's sort of like, you know, I mean, get with the program or get lost, cuck. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like, all right, I mean, great, you, you've persuaded me. Right, right. <laughs> like, and anyway, um, but I don't think most Americans are caught up in the, the hardcore, like, you know, hero worship thing. I do think it's very odd how the left in particular feels like they can somehow perfect society through political action. Um, and the, the excuses- Government's horrible, it's always messed up. If we only had more of it, right. it would fix everything. Socialism's never really been tried properly. Right, Venezuela, uh, it, it, no, but there's reasons it didn't Yeah, they, they've screwed that up, but believe me, <laughs> the principles work. We'll get back to us on how. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, well, let me ask you a little more difficult question than Republicans that you respect. Are there any Democrats that you think haven't gone completely insane? No, they're all bad for America. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, look, there, there are some uh, Democrats that I certainly respect more than others. Uh, sometimes I'll play this game with some of my liberal friends, like, who, you know, who's your favorite? Um, and there are cop-out answers, like, you know, my favorite Democratic senator was Zell Miller, <laughs> uh, you know, who just gave a wild stem winder of a speech at the Republican National the, Convention. Yeah, exactly. In that was the most confusing thing ever. It was the line, like, you never remember lines from convention speeches, yeah. but I remember him ripping into John Kerry and saying, what does he think we can defend America with? Spit bottles? <laughs> and everyone went crazy. Yeah. Um, she bothers me sometimes, but I have to say that I respect Dianne Feinstein. I think that she's not always predictable. She's not always a hack. I think she takes national security pretty seriously. Um, You're I think just she, picking her because she's on her way out. Well, no, but I think she has respect for institutions. I, I have to confess I, I like Joe Biden. I think that he's just sort of a, a fun dude that I like to hang out with. Um, but when you see a guy like Biden, or even when you see the moderate, what, what are thought of as more of the moderates, even though they're probably all too big government for you, but when you think of like a, a Chuck Schumer or a Biden or sort of that older group, mm -hmm. do you think it's over for that wing? Like, do you think that the the I'm not sure if Bernie Schumer counts as that wing. Right, so I, so. Schumer's somewhere in the middle. And I, look, I have no love lost for Chuck Schumer, but like he also voted against, or they didn't really ever vote on it, but he came out against the Iran deal, which yeah. I thought was Well, that's what I'm saying, though. He's a little more of a centrist. He didn't right. play the party line there. I, right. I see the left now dragging the Democrats much further to the left. Mm -hmm. Do you see the, any chance for whoever you think those moderates are, whether you include Schumer in that or Joe Biden, even though he's not no, in the I'm, government I'm right now? I am very worried that we are heading in a European model direction where we have an ever-growing state, we have socialists to the left and sort of more nationalists to the right, and there's not much of a real home or constituency for limited government constitutional conservatism. That is something that I'm concerned about. Um, I think for a number of reasons, I don't feel welcome, I, we alluded to this earlier, I don't feel welcome in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, and even when I am at peak exasperation with the Republicans, the Democrats show up and do something where I'm like, well, <laughs> nope. Yeah. Uh, but the, the Republicans have been trying awfully hard uh, to, to alienate me, and I, and I think part of it is just like, all right, try to stay intellectually grounded, uh, take each issue and circumstance as it comes and evaluate it as best as I can on the merits, 
And that's how I try to go about my job, writing at Town Hall, uh, giving analysis on Fox News, and that's the best I can do. And it's going to make some people unhappy, and that's fine. And hopefully some other people are going to find it refreshing, and I just sort of let the chips fall. Yeah. Uh, so when you say constitution, limited government, all yeah. of that, low tax stuff, all that kind of stuff, what about a uh, Rand Paul? To just it's the foreign policy stuff that gets you? Yeah, yeah, I think he's probably a little bit like, I would take him over his dad any day of the week. Um, I, I don't think, and part of me is also like there's a pragmatism element here as well. Like I think it, there are certain people who are outside of the Overton window mm -hmm. of electability nationally. Now, maybe I'm not the best judge of that because based on all of his polling numbers, I thought that the man who was elected president couldn't <laughs> be elected. He had the wonderful benefit of running against a truly historically atrocious candidate um, who's writing a book about why she lost. I'm sure that's gonna be really a wonderful, uh, compelling- What's it called, What read. Happened? What Happened. What Happened, like, I mean, what a be, terrible name for a it book. It could be a one-page book. Yeah. It could be a one-sentence book. I'm terrible. Yeah. yeah. The end, um, you know, but um, yeah, Rand Paul, I don't know. This last election has made me think long and hard about how many people actually view the world and view the political system the way I do. I used to think that people like me were the clear majority within the Republican Party, and I am less convinced of that than ever. And so Rand Paul is, I think in theory, I'm with him on a lot of yeah. stuff. I don't know if that s is gonna sell to the American people. Um, I mean, look at, I mean, we, we elected a Republican president who drew a line in the sand saying, I will not touch the entitlement programs, which are, which have to be, it's just it's basic math. And George Will had this column, if the Republicans are no longer gonna be the party of math, what is the point of them? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm worried about. So it's interesting, in an odd way, I'm frustrated with the left because I see them going too far left, big government. Mm -hmm. uh, you're frustrated with the right because you see them trending in that direction too. Yeah, right? yeah. So in, that, in that's a really ways. interesting spot to be in. And I do think there was all this like thumb-sucking analysis for years about how the Republicans were this moving radically to the right and they were unrecognizable and there was very little parallel commentary about what was happening on the left. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the Republican Party is and what exactly it stands for, aside from not the left. There's something useful in being not the left. I think fighting the left is a useful, worthwhile endeavor, but aside from sort of the, uh, the anti-left general impulse or sentiment, I'm not exactly sure what the coherent philosophy of the party is, mm -hmm. uh, which is a weird feeling to have, but that's, that's where we are, I think, for me. So one of the things that I've talked about with almost everyone in the last couple of months, at least anyone that's political on the show, has been th that almost everyone has been satisfied with the destruction that's happening with mainstream media right now. Mm -hmm. You're sort of on both sides of it because you're, you're a mainstream guy, as we said, you do stuff on Fox, but you do online stuff as well. I, you know, the fact that you have a Twitter presence that's active, like you get internet culture, I think. Mm -hmm. um, are you as satisfied as I am that mainstream media is crumbling? Because I'm pretty thrilled. I, I think there's been such a destructive aspect to it and to your point earlier of they were, were all leftists yeah. and watching that crumble, so hopefully something more sane will come out of it. I may be wrong. Yeah. That, that may give all the power to the Alex Joneses of the world. Yeah. You know. I mean, I've, I've always believed in a marketplace of ideas and uh, not this top-down media environment where, you know, for many years, for decades, it was basically two newspapers and three networks decided what the news was, and that was it. Um, and slowly but surely, people have been chipping away at that with talk radio and Fox News, and of course now the internet, uh, which I think it's, it, this is a positive development for sure. Uh, and, and I think that the biased media that, it's so funny that they are always worried about the credibility of other people, and they seem less aware that their own credibility is like a thing that mm -hmm. they have lost in the eyes of many people. Like when a lot of polling shows the media less trusted than Trump, like that should be a wake up call, but for them it's sort of like they're on this high horse and it's in like it's not penetrating. Uh, so I, I take a good deal of satisfaction uh, 
in, in sort of seeing some of that come down because mm -hmm. it's, it's earned, they've deserved it. I don't think it's an unmitigated positive either though because for two reasons. First, I do believe in objective truth. I do believe that there is something that is correct and something that is incorrect. And I think it is useful to have people who are credible who can call those shots. And I'm not saying that the media has epitomized this because they haven't, yeah. but we do need those voices, which is why I appreciate people like Jake Tapper or Brett Baer, and there's a number of them. Um, we need to value that still and not throw the baby out with the uh, bathwater completely. And then the other side of this concern that I have is we, in this, in, in this current media environment, we can just construct delightful, comfortable, cocoon-like echo chambers for ourselves where we pick and choose, like on Spotify, yeah. the only stuff we want to listen to and ingest and then just dismiss everything else as fake or biased or right-wing propaganda or fake news or whatever you know the term is going to be. And that does not contribute to a healthy society. When you have large sections of the country off in their separate ideological silos where counter arguments don't really penetrate and there's not um, a devotion to truth and intellectual honesty, that's not, I don't think that's a positive. So do you think we could have a legit third party then for the, for the refugees of the left that I like, that I think I'm trying to offer what, what classical liberalism, what real no. liberalism is, for guys like you that are going, the party's actually not doing the conservative things that I want them to do. You just think it, the, the machine is too big. The machine and then also just like, so okay, and here's, here's why I'm not optimistic on that front. And again, I could be proven wrong. I don't think that I, you know, I'm, have the last word on any of this stuff, but wait, you're what, saying not everything you say here will prove out to be absolutely. I mean, I'd, I'd give it. I'd give myself like a like a 92 percent accuracy rating, <laughs> give or take. We'll, uh, we'll do this again in a year from yeah, now. Exactly. With the scorecard. Yeah, exactly. Just like play back the tape. I just sit here with a bag over my head. <laughs> um, but I think the the data point I would point to is the 2016 election. Right on election day, according to all the exit polling. Donald Trump had a 60% disapproval rating, and he won. <laughs> Hillary Clinton had a 55, 56% disapproval rating. These are toxic people who most people did not like, did not trust, couldn't relate to. It was our two major parties putting out the very worst, really, that they possibly could. And they still got, you know, combined for, what, 95, 96% of the national vote? I mean, the Libertarians put out a ticket of two former multi-term governors who sort of crashed and burned and were terrible. Jill Stein, sort of a moon bat. <laughs> um, you know, Evan McMullen has turned out to be super annoying. Um, like, this was the moment. This was the moment to be like, these parties are failing, they suck so hard. Someone, and, and it was just nothing. So, who knows, someone might emerge. You're telling me I wasted my vote on Gary Johnson. I don't think it's a wasted vote. So I voted for a third party as well. Um, I felt, well, I felt well, like- I assume you mean Gary Johnson, in, right? In 2016- What other third party could you have voted for? In 2016, hold that thought, <laughs> I honestly felt like every person running for president was actively trying to lose my vote at all times. <laughs> like, I'd be like, I'd watch Hillary, I'm like, God, she's awful. Yeah. Maybe it's second look at Trump. And then I turn him on, I'm like, oh God. I'm like, all right, Gary, give it to me. And it's like, nope, yeah. nope, nope, nope. And so it's like the person that I heard from most recently was the one I was most upset with all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, that's, but again, I don't think it's a wasted vote. Like, I don't th think that anyone just deserves my vote by the, like, I don't think the Democrats deserve my vote because I'm gay. I don't think the Republicans always deserve my vote just because I'm more with them than not. Like. It does take a lot for me not to vote for a Republican, but by God, it's been happening. Yeah, um, but so who'd you vote for? I ended up voting for McMullen. Really? Yeah, just he was on the ballot in Virginia. I actually sat in the booth, or stood there in the voters booth. There were four names on the ballot. Um, 
it was Hillary Trump, Johnson, and McMullen. I actually interviewed Gary Johnson for a town hall in a sit down like this. Oh, you, right, I saw it. That yeah. was when I finally snapped against him because you, you did a great job in that interview. Except the purpose of the interview was to be like, dude, you're this libertarian and you keep trying to sell Bernie supporters. Like, sell me. Yeah. I should be your target audience. So they agreed, they came, we sat down. And I wanted to ask him about limited government and all this stuff. And he jumped down my throat about using the term illegal immigrants and got super triggered by it and told me you can't use the, that term and started shouting. And I was like, bro, like, what are you doing here? I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I forgot that you were the one that did that. And, yeah. and I talked about it because I had about a month before the first debate, I publicly did this thing about why I'm gonna support Gary Johnson. I just want new ideas out there. I want limited government and yeah. low taxes to be heard at least and individual rights and blah, blah, blah. And I knew he, he wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna work, but whatever, I said, I'm gonna at least try. If I can do anything with my voice, let me try at least. But then there was the Aleppo thing and he couldn't name the leader he liked. But then your interview to me was the one where it like completely yeah. snapped. And again, he's a decent man, I, yeah. I, you know, but because he kept saying the thing about, uh, because you kept saying illegal immigrant and he said it's an incendiary term, but you kept asking him, Why? well, are they not illegal? Are they not illegal? And then at the end, I mean, he correct me, he, he basically was like, yes, you're right. And I was like, that was the worst. I don't want to pile on the guy, what's the point? The, anyway, the, I think where we- <laughs> But you did a nice job there. I appreciate that, yeah, that but, yeah. I, but I stood there on election day, looking at these four names, and I really had this moment where I contemplated checking the box for all of them at, at some like running through the list. And the one that I felt least agita or indigestion over at the time was Evan McMullen, although he seems to be working overtime since the election to make me regret my vote for him with just sort of the nonstop Russia, Russia. hysteria. And yeah. I believe that the Russia investigation is important. I am not, you know, automatically inclined to believe that Trump is, or his people are completely innocent or whatever. I think the way they've handled it has been terrible. Um, but the hysteria and the and the feeding of that fire, it's just, it's too much. And and he's been at the forefront of that. And I'm just like, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> there were no good options on the ballot for me. And I know that's not true for a lot of people. There's probably people watching screaming, you know, sort of like, of course Trump was the best option. Are you stupid? Um, I see the argument for that. I could, I could sit here and make the cogent make America great again argument totally, and there are large elements of truth to it. Just for me, I found, and I, we don't have to relitigate this election, it's so depressing, but I thought that he was fundamentally unfit to be president, and I thought she was ethically unfit and ideologically unacceptable. Well, I like talking to somebody that's trying to you know, stay true to their trying. morals and their philosophies yeah, in, the, in the midst of a political thing that's tough. Um, all right, well, I think we should do this again sometime. Yeah, uh, please. You know, we were gonna go out tonight, but, and I think we would have had the most boring gay night. People think when gay people go out, it's gonna be some incredible, but I don't sense that the two of us could, we would have had fun, but nice conversation, but yeah. it wouldn't have been like whatever they think gay people are doing. I don't think we, we could have got there. I mean, I brought. I'm, I'm having dinner with, with friends who have kids now. See, so you're, and you're, you're, and you're, then I on. said, maybe I'll meet you after, and you were like, ah, I gotta get to bed early. I mean, this is pathetic. Well, hang on, I, this is, this is <laughs> you're, you're revealing all the secrets here. I, how do you know that I don't have glitter and ecstasy just waiting? Well, because for, the way you said glitter yeah, and, and, and ecstasy, yeah, there's no, just no chance. It's been a long, long day, and I'm very much looking forward to sleeping. To, all right, I can lend you some glitter. <laughs> but I can't go out, unfortunately. All right, LA, well, it was, a, it was LA, a pleasure. Man. It was a pleasure talking to you. And for more on Guy, follow him on that Twitter machine. It's at Guy P. Benson.